Hey, it's Andrew Morgan, host of the NOMCAST, the Netflix original movie podcast. Each week we preview and review the biggest Netflix original movies with special guests from the film industry, the music industry, comedians, and of course our fellow critics and podcasters. The NOMCAST is available on NOMCASTpod.com or wherever you get your podcasts on the socials at NOMCASTpod and is a part of the Forgotten Entertainment family. Do you like beer? Do you like podcasts? Do you like beer podcasts? Then check out Crack and One Open, a podcast about brews, news, and pop culture reviews. Every week we crack open a new craft beer from breweries around the country. And sometimes the world. We'll talk about how it was made, what's in it, the history of the brew, and the brewery. Then we'll give our tasting notes, and while we're finishing up, we'll talk about some of the latest goings-on in the world of pop culture. So check out Crack and One Open with Mike and Elise, part of the Forgotten Entertainment family. Hi, I'm Shamar Griffith, codename Comic Shams. And I'm Andrew Tejada, codename Arate. I'm a blurred with a love for artwork and comics and animation. And I'm a writer and blurred with a love for pretty much the same things. We grew up together and spent most of our formative years watching and talking about DC superhero shows and content. In fact, we still do. Every episode, we will discuss a DC production, compare it to its original source material, and share our thoughts on the adaptation. We've enjoyed our conversations these past couple of decades, and we think you will too. This season, we'll put a shock to our system by covering Static Shock, the animated series on... Yet another DC animated podcast. Welcome to yet another episode of yet another DC animated podcast. My name is Shamar Griffith, codename Comic Shams. And I am Andrew Tejada, codename Arate. Andrew and I have known each other since 1996. That was the year The Quest, starring Jean-Claude Van Damme, was released. That, do you remember this one? It, uh, uh, the, it's Mortal Kombat, if it was boring. <laughs> if it, I was like, you said if it was boring? <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, just there's no superpowers, there's no special combos or anything. But one of the actors in the movie did voice Yao Ming in one of our episodes. Wow. Um, so, yes, that is true, y'all, because I found out in these sets of static episodes that my entire life has been a lie. Uh, <laughs> we are reviewing today episodes seven through nine of season four of Static Shock. We were talking about Hoop Squad. We're talking about Now You See Him and finally When Rubber Meets the Road. And because our episodes here are just filled with characters that we've seen in previous episodes and some pretty big names in the NBA from back in the day, uh, we got to call this one the OGs because everybody mm -hmm. and their mom is returning for this one, especially the main cast of Static Shock. And then we have some newcomers here as well with John DiMaggio, who is basically his resume is as long as Phil Lamar's, to be honest who is voicing Tarmac in our When the Rubber Meets the Road episode. Nice, nice. And speaking of Phil Lamar, along with voicing Static, he actually also voices Tracy McGrady, a.k.a. Spin Drive, in our Hoop Squad episode. You mean that wasn't Tracy McGrady either? It wasn't. <laughs> My entire <laughs> life has been a lie. <laughs> We do have one person from the NBA that actually did drop into this episode. Carl Malone, the mailman himself, does deliver here in our episode, Hoop Squad. Next up, we got Chris Cox, who is voicing Steve Nash, a.k.a. Point Man, in the Hoop Squad episode. And you actually may have already heard Steve, uh, Chris Cox's voice because he has voiced Deadshot, Hawkeye, Star-Lord, Captain America, Shining Knight, Captain Adam, Commissioner Gordon, Aquaman, the Scarecrow and Batman Hush, and our new favorite name, at least my new favorite name, Rip Jagger in Batman Soul of the Dragon. That's too many. He's done. <laughs> He's re <laughs> Tell him not to come back into the booth anymore. <laughs> You've done enough. Where you have legit gone through our entire DC universe here. <laughs> Next, again, we brought him up just now from The Quest. We have the star Jen Sung Alderbridge, who is voicing Yao Ming today. And the reason why he is getting a special shout out today is because in the movie, spoilers, he gets the Bane special as the villain of the movie breaks his back in a way that makes Bratman even cringe today. Oh, 
Damn. And chiropractors in DC, they're make they're making so much money. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, this voice actor has been in the game since 1984, and he's been going ham in the animation and the gaming world. He's most famous for being Barry Allen in the Lego universe and also in the Young Justice series. He voices Green Arrow and Guy Gardner in Batman Brave and the Bold. He is Ratchet in Ratchet and Clank. Whoa. He's Harry Osborn in probably the best Spider-Man animated series ever created. We're talking about Spectacular Spider-Man. Finally, this is my hot take. If you love Ian McGregor's Obi-Wan Kenobi because of Clone Wars, you have a false king because this man is the true voice of Obi-Wan in the Clone Wars animated series as we have James Arnold Taylor, who is voicing Eddie Felsen in our Now You See Him episode. Wow. So I, I'm t- so you drop an Obi-Wan on me and you're telling me <laughs> these are the episodes they put in? <laughs> 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 yeah, we got uh, our knockoff Flash, but he eventually does get the Flash title. Yeah. <laughs> well, but that's a wrap up on our cast list. This is a huge cast in these episodes as you're going to start off with Hoop Squad, where Virgil and Richie are really experiencing that California love thanks to Robert Hawkins' work in a charity fundraiser. Yeah, apparently Robert is the only one fundraising for this <laughs> entire charity because they they reward him with vip tickets to the all-star game and they and you know it's richie it's virgil it's robert and while robert goes to the hotel richie and virgil just walk in the arena and they meet our four titular basketball stars Yes, we got the mailman, Carl Malone, who's actually voicing himself. We also see Tracy McGrady come through, Yao Ming, and finally Steve Nash. And they're all practicing on the court. I am wondering, though, where the fifth person is, because usually there's a five-man team in basketball, so it is a little confusing to only see four of them. Not not in the the special all-star game. (laughs) (laughs) They tried it once and never did it again. (laughs) So uh, Virgil and Richie are just ecstatic to to meet all the players, especially Carl Malone. And as he's passing the ball over to them, uh, Gear and Static or Virgil and Richie are just wondering if they could just sign it right now. So as he pulls out that marker to sign it, this is where things go a little crazy as this like bluish cloud basically disintegrates the ball. It disintegrates all their sneakers and shoes. The backboard on the um on the hoop is gone, and so are our players. Yeah, uh, it, it wasn't because Richie was wearing the knockoff Air Force Sevens or anything like that. It's uh, there was something going on, and they figure out pretty quickly. There's there's a big robot <laughs> that that's outside, made up of all uh, these tiny parts, and Static and Gear are having a bit of a problem because this robot can dodge blows. Kind of reminded me a lot of Majin Buu, you know, because mm. Majin Buu's like can like open up parts of his body so blows go right through. And yeah, this robot can dodge blows. It could take punishment, and it seemed to be worried about Richie's amount of technology as Gear. So it looks like our heroes are uh, they're done. I guess this is where the series ends. But wait, who's that in the distance? (laughs) The Power Rangers show up. And (laughs) we see these guys, these like, uh, these guys wearing these suits. They look almost as if they might be kind of like metal men. Um, As they fly on into the fight, they static tries to go off to stop them because he figures that the best that they might be working alongside this um, monster, this monster, this robot And they immediately fly past Static saying, chill out, man, we're on your side. As they start attacking the giant robot. And this robot immediately turns their attention towards them and starts attacking them. But we do see that these uh, these people, they have like these abilities as well. The one that's dressed in yellow and purple, his fists grow into a crazy size. 
And we see also that one of them is able to spin really fast, kind of like the Tasmanian Devil. Another one is able to stretch a lot. Like um, the best way I can describe it is like Miss Marvel or Mr. Fantastic, maybe Elongated yeah, yeah. Man, Plastic Man. Yeah. And then the last one, uh, <laughs> my dude got bullets in his fingertips, yo. That was Point Man, right? Yeah, that was Point Man. <laughs> I feel like he got to choose his suit last. <laughs> <laughs> this is the this is the Ash Pokemon scenario all over again. So you wake up late. There's only one thing left. <laughs> yeah, it's like I got, he's a human tornado. He's elongating himself, and you're shooting. You're shooting projectiles like you could normally do. <laughs> and they can all fly, I guess, which is something. I don't know. But um, during this battle, I have to notice that while the, you know, we, we appreciate this this team fighting the robot. But at one point, the civilians are about to get hit by a train and the team does nothing. <laughs> they don't do a single thing to help the civilians. Static by himself, because gear was in trouble by himself, had to lift this train and save all the civilians. And I love seeing him do it. However, why do these people have no regard for human life? (laughs) (laughs) uh, I want to say it's because basketball players normally don't interact with their fans while the game is on, except if you're, um, what's his name again? Uh, Metal World Peace? Um, Just thinking back to the mouse. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) So as they're all fighting, the robot static is able to save the crowds. Unfortunately, though, the robot uh, is able to grab gear and turn itself into this giant vortex that disappears alongside with gear. Static tries to make his way back. but Unfortunately, he gets knocked out for a quick second, and this leads to gear being taken while our Hoop Squad, as they're calling themselves, now introduce themselves to Static. We got Carmelone, who's calling himself the Pulverizer. Nash is the Point Man. Uh, Tracy McGrady is Spin Drive. And the one that's a bit of a stretch, um, Yao Ming calls himself Sensor Force. And, like, I get it. <laughs> These are uh, these are just like little basketball terms. Like I, I figured that they're saying that he's a force because he's a center and on the on the basketball team. But at the same time, his powers does not connect with his name whatsoever. Yeah, it could literally have been like wingspan or reach or like handle. Stretch. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> like something. stretch. Like I don't know. <laughs> they're all bad names. Um <laughs> <laughs> They, it was clear that, that whoever designed their suits is not a good creative naming person. And after fully exposing their identities to Static, two seconds after meeting him, uh, they decide to go back to the headquarters, which Static is like, yo, I don't have time for your little headquarters, guys. And he sh- they show them up because it's a nice little headquarters it's got scientists it's got a whole crew it's pretty big again showing up his gas station of solitude and we get an explanation um (laughs) that uh these nba players were chosen because they ask who else has the strength and skill to operate these power suits everybody (laughs) (laughs) first of all every other sport to start with firefighters soldiers why the <laughs> hell are you going basketball players first anyone with time literally the way that batman could always win with prep time batman can operate this suit let's be honest because <laughs> it also had me wondering immediately what happens when uh captain cold is holding up the bank during the nba finals do they leave the game? <laughs> Huh? I, I'm guessing not. I'm guessing they're going to stay and play through the, the fourth quarter. Right. I think Cold's going to win. <laughs> You're going to see some mean technicals happen just so they can escape. <laughs> <laughs> so we find out a bit more about the NBA basically creating a super team. 
Uh, we find out that the NBA not only stands for the National Basketball Association, but also the National Biotech Authority, because they are just working on these suits. And again, just putting more into the Power Rangers theme that they created here. We get this, uh, we meet the leader of the of the hoop squad it is a scientist by the name of mason andrew he is apparently the liaison between the two companies <laughs> <laughs> it's like how does that work it's like there's a scientist could ask like 20 basketball trivia questions and if you get them all right <laughs> you're the liaison <laughs> and he also has a backup which is uh legata uh is this robot that he has walking alongside him and honestly this thing gave me alpha five five i i wrote down that in the notes <laughs> i'm so glad you said it because i was like this is alpha five right here <laughs> this is the <laughs> ultimate power rangers rip off four basketball players with attitude <laughs> <laughs> oh god it's a good thing they didn't put it around our test <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i think they tried that was the first iteration <laughs> That's why they had to pick some more obscure names. <laughs> so, well, we'll stop making fun of the Hoop Squad momentarily. We'll get right, back right, to yes, yeah. But they, uh, got, they got some more time. <laughs> <laughs> so they find out that this huge giant robot is operated by the scientist whose name I didn't bother to learn, but he basically <laughs> says, <laughs> "Either give me a hundred million dollars, or I'll destroy the West Coast of the United States." And personally, I think he was aiming way too low. You're, you're talking about destroying multiple states and untold number of lives. You can ask for a little bit more money. Oh, that was the, it, it was, we, we're, we're counting in inflation right now. I think that's just what it is. <laughs> I guess so. I, I don't know. I would, I would be asking for at least two billion on that one. <laughs> so, we hop back now over to where the scientist, uh, Dr. Oh, I almost said opium. Uh, I think it was something like that. Uh, he is talking to Gear, and the two of them, their Gear is just trying to like break out of this, the restraints that's being held in. This doctor is telling him that, like, yo, I feel like you, sh- you and I will connect. And unfortunately, as Gear is kind of wriggling to try to get out of his restraints, his shock box does fall out of his pocket. And the doctor decides this is a good time for me to try to trick Static and the rest of the Hoop Squad because I know that they're together. And we see that kind of happen in our next scene where I am now have my biggest question of all because as Static picks up his cell phone, uh, it's his dad. His dad's calling him to check in where he and Richie are. And static has no excuse he he um, he for i mean this time around he ate his gas x or took his probiotics because <laughs> he has no bathroom excuse and so the only thing that could they could do is have carl malone take the phone from him and basically say that hey mr hawkins i'm he's cool they're both cool we just we're just hanging out with them and robert instantly starts to fanboy about this whole thing but the thing that i really have this question about is how does the Hoop Squad know that Virgil and Richie are static in gear? Excellent question that they're not going to answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, there must have, there seriously must have been a deleted scene or like something cut where Virgil shared his identity mm-hmm. with them because, yeah, I was like, why do they know your identity all of a sudden? Did you willingly give it up? Because like, you had a whole thing with Shebang, Shebang about your identity like two episodes ago. Mm-hmm. Like, what's going on, bro? Uh, I kind of have a feeling that Shaq snitched. That's what I feel. You know what? Yeah. Yeah, Snack has, Shaq has a big mouth in the NBA. So <laughs> when he got rejected from the program, he was like, you know what? I got a secret for y'all. I hung out with Virgil. <laughs> He's trying to use his leverage. <laughs> exactly. And they're like, thanks for the tip. So we'll call him. And they're like, we're not calling you, though. Um, we saw <laughs> steel. Uh, <laughs> so now that everyone knows identities and stuff, uh, they get a message from the shock box. And apparently scientist, uh, he just needs a placeholder. I'm going to call him Mr. Lab coat, um, evil so Mr. Lab coat. 
<laughs> um, he uses this voice changing technology he apparently has to mimic Richie's voice and lures Virgil and the Hoop Squad into a sewer trap where they get surrounded by all these nanobots coming to eat them. And luckily, though, Sensor Force and Spin Drive combine their powers uh, to make the ultimate hero the drill as they are able to drill through 20 feet of concrete to finally escape. Unfortunately, they do hit one of the sewer lines, and this causes for all the sewage water to flow down. Um, It does knock out a lot of the nanobots, making them to short circuit. However, as our heroes escape, we get everybody just covered in sewage water. And I think probably the most fun that they probably will have in this episode as Point Man, apparently his suit gets waterlogged and now all of the water is just coming out of his, um, out of the points in which he's supposed to be shooting at the projectiles, earning himself the new nickname, the water boy. Yeah. That's a pretty big design flaw. Also like Mm -hmm. how did it get in the suit? Um, there's also that line where they go like, you're very smart for a short person to Virgil. And I'm like, what is, what is happening? <laughs> What's height have to do with yeah. intelligence? You guys are like, you guys are also like 50 feet tall. Like, relax. <laughs> so Static eventually figures out how to track Mr. Evil Lab Coat. And they all, the Hoop Squad and Static show up to the right place. And I'll give them this. There is a one good taunt where they go, I'm going to Beat, mess you up so bad you're gonna need plastic surgery just so people can call you ugly <laughs> <laughs> that that is a good line i'll give it to them that is the one good line <laughs> yeah but, but uh nope there's not much sh- no more good lines after that it's just fighting <laughs> <laughs> yeah they uh they really speed through this one um i kind of timed it and um between when they met up with dr evil lab coat and when they defeated him, now some crazy stuff happens. We find out that the doctor is actually a machine and the, his real body is somewhere else. So he's using the machine to manipulate things. And that machine takes on the all the abilities of the nanites, turning himself into the monster again. And between them dropping that line about him being ugly to his ultimate defeat because they decided to blow up the machine that he's using to create these tremors is a solid one minute and 35 seconds. Wow. You guys uh, really wanted to be done with this episode as much as we did, huh? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Uh, And then after that, it is basically a very quick wrap up. We have gear breaking out of his restraints with the help of backpack, which I don't know why that wasn't just something that was done before. And he ultimately just ends up finding the real doctor in a stasis pod. He unlocks him. And then the hoop squad just basically say that leave him in there to let him know that his plans have been rejected. And we have to wrap up this episode because I can't take it anymore as we cut to the game where Virgil and Richie are calling the Who Squad by their real names. Robert's confused and we end it with Carl Malone grabbing the ball. And now you see him end our episode, fortunately, with a slam dunk. Well, moving right along to... uh... (laughs) 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 Um, So now you see him it starts off with Daisy um, and fully recovered, you know, from her the last time we saw her. Um, and she is in the mall just enjoying a day, looking at a necklace she wants. And all of a sudden, the mall is attacked by the Flash. Well, mm-hmm. it's not the Flash, but it looks just like him. And he's running throughout the <laughs> running throughout the mall, stealing MP3s because that's Richie correctly notices as he shows up on the scene with static cds are too bulky steel mp3s richie was thinking ahead so as they're chasing after this blur uh, unfortunately they are quickly taken down because they're unable to catch him so we have to cut back because the villain has escaped uh static and gear are basically caught just 
without any way to resolve this issue. So they head on back to the abandoned gas station of Solitude. Seems like it's the next day. Richie is doing some work as Virgil burst in and says that like he's so happy because he Sharon scores some tickets to go see B2K. <laughs> <laughs> and he she's unable to see it so she has he has two tickets right now and richie just says oh my gosh i can't believe it you know i'm such a huge b2k fan which virgil corrects him as saying that actually daisy is the bigger fan and richie sw- quickly realizes that he has to take an l yeah you know what i virgil again i would do the same thing I understand. Yes, he chose made the right choice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He chose Daisy over Brainy. I got you, bro. <laughs> yeah, you, you could y'all could break into the concert conceivably at any time with your suite of powers, but you you gotta do what you gotta do. So now back at the mall, we see Daisy's walking around, but also there's a guy that seems to be following her and and just stalking her around the mall and quickly appearing and disappearing. And when he tries to hit on her, you know, tries to like see, hey, could we go on a date? Because we spent that summer at the nerd camp together. (laughs) Did you want to go on a date? (laughs) Virgil luckily pulls in. Not only, now this is an excellent save because he pulls in and says, oh, but we're going to the B2K concert, so you can't do it. So now Virgil can be like, I saved you from that dude. And also I pulled up with your favorite tickets. I see your game, man. I see mm-hmm. your game, and I'm loving it. <laughs> uh, Daisy quickly picks up on the fact that, like, she definitely got these B2K tickets. And as this dude, Eddie, he um, he starts walking away, very just sad over the fact that, unfortunately, he's not going to get that date with Daisy. He does think of ways in which he can impress her even more. And he, we see him looking again at the same necklace that Daisy has been looking at um, since the beginning of our episode. As now, once again, Virgil heads on now to go on patrol, meets up with Richie and, as gear. And the two of them are just talking about everything that happened. You know, Virgil is happy. He's going on this date with Daisy. But now they got to circle back to the mall because, I mean, now at this point, it's definitely clear that Eddie is this speedster who has been stealing from the mall, which is weird because it's just like, why are you only stealing from one place if you have all of this power? Right. Like, you got the entire Dakota to do this with, and it's clear, you know, he's just that into stalking Daisy. And um, I I do love this scene because he steals the necklace Daisy was looking at earlier. And the place is like, we've been robbed. And I'm like, dude, he stole one thing. (laughs) I think you've got off pretty easy. Um, But the mall that, okay, this makes sense in Dakota, that the mall would have a full lockdown procedure with steel gates and stuff. (laughs) But I was still like, this mall is a little bit too ready to shut down everybody inside of it and like do a complete lockdown. Um, but now Static and Gear can finally confront the new villain, um, uh, Eddie, right? Speed Trap, was this? Did he go by Speed Trap? He went by Speed Warp. Unfortunately, Speed Trap was already taken by, um, uh, Mr. Trapper. Oh, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> so we see how powerful he is because Richie tries to attack him and, Eddie is so fast, he can reverse the attack and send it right back at Richie. This reminds me a lot of um, the Still Force from the Flash series. Mm. Like the the villain Turtle, who was able to slow down time around him, given the sense as if he's actually moving super fast. But it's actually... Um, Eddie has this thing on his hand that he, whenever he snaps on his fingers, it slows down time to a point where he's actually still moving at his own speed, but everything else is slowed down around him. It reminded me of that very long explanation of comic books real quick there. Um, but he does use his attacks to manipulate gears, weapons, and to quickly take down static. And there is a really cool scene in which static just really pissed over the fact that he keeps getting caught like this he unleashes this form of the spirit bomb that sends out 
little mini blasts all throughout the mall. Unfortunately, there isn't any way to direct the attack as it starts blowing up things left and right. It even hits backpack. And honestly, I think backpack might be out of the commission for a little bit. Yeah. I mean, thank you for making the shocking scene of destruction easy. <laughs> I mean, the property damage you did to that mall is significantly higher than anything Eddie did. And uh, the results were disappointing because it didn't do anything. Eddie got away. And in the meantime, the more concerning thing is that Eddie using his hyper time abilities, he, you find out he can take people into hyper time with him. And he also uses it to unmask Richie. And by association, he figures out who Virgil is. So now they're like, I know who you are. I know where you live. If you mess with me, you can't catch me. And he gets away. And I mean, honestly, it, he his threat level increased from zero to 60 real quick. Mm -hmm. So uh, we cut to the scene now. Daisy is at home reading. We see her shrine of B2K has basically taken over her entire room because uh, girl had posters for days. <laughs> Oh, yeah. During the scene, there's a song playing that is like a rock emo song. I was mm -hmm. like, why isn't it a B2K song? <laughs> <laughs> like, you set it up as a B2K, and it's just like, my mother left me. You know, it's like, what are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> they can only pay for the, they blew all the money on Car Malone. That's why they couldn't get the oh, rest right, of the right, labels, right, right. Okay. as well as like the, the actual B2K rights. They do play them later on, but not long enough that it would have made sense. <laughs> yeah, I guess they could only afford one time, and they're like, well, you better use it wisely. <laughs> so while Daisy's at home reading, the necklace magically appears on her, on her dresser, and she is shocked. She's trying to figure out what is going on as Eddie is outside looking at her with, like, joy over the fact of, like, you know, he like he was able to give her something that she really wanted. But dude left no note, no card, not even a text to say it was from him. So now you just basically made her the criminal in this scenario. So, Eddie, y y if you want to do all this, it you got to do it how it makes sense. Um, because otherwise, the person that you want the most is about to get locked up. Yeah, and Daisy's not the only one in trouble because Eddie's former professor kind of realizes way too late that, <laughs> that all this is going on and he decides you know he needs to intervene but eddie doesn't like that much and as the professor is on a plane uh eddie's wrapped tied him up looks pretty bad so again static and gear have to come in and save the professor and gear can't cut the professor free, free because he didn't pack scissors in his uh in his backpack. <laughs> he has everything, everything but scissors, huh? Right, bro, even the Swiss Army knife comes with scissors, or at least a blade. Like you could have done something. I know you have a buzzsaw in there. I've seen you <laughs> use it. And they're as they're worried about crashing this plane, uh static, he heads on outside. He's trying to hold it together because we've lost an engine on it um, and another one's about to fly off and they're doing their best to keep the plane afloat long enough for gear who has logged 200 hours on his flight simulator game at home he the two of them are now working together to try to at least land this in an area of dakota that's basically the streets so unfortunately there is even though this block is completely empty, there is not even a single parked car around where they were. This one car decides to drive its way wherever it's going. Um, and right before it gets hit by the plane, Static's able to pull it out the way. But Gear does end up hitting another car as he straight up T-bones this thing. And we end up with a little joke as this whole thing goes down of Static asking Gear, did he actually just run into his dad's car, which gives him like the fear of God instantly. I also like this scene because it's a very lighthearted when they could have killed thousands. Of people. Oh, yes. <laughs> if that went any, like so many people could die. 
<laughs> but luckily, uh, things are they they avoided disaster. And although the police try to interfere, and there, I do like this one strong police officer who does the battering ram by himself. <laughs> Like, He's been waiting for that moment all his <laughs> life. <laughs> like, come on, Meadows, let's go. Um, <laughs> they can't catch up to Eddie in time. And, you know, Virgil tries to just enjoy the concert with Daisy that night and just try to get his mind off of Eddie. But Eddie does his uh, hyperforce thing and just to hit on a girl, which I think is the definition of peak toxic masculinity. Mm-hmm. Like she, she, she had tickets to a whole concert. Like you could have, you could, I mean, one, she doesn't want you, but even if you wanted to, like you could have waited, man. Like she interrupted, he interrupted B2K right at the moment when they were about to do that flip that you saw and you got served. Mm. I don't like Eddie, yo. <laughs> it's like, so as he starts to explain to her that the two of them could be together in this whole, time because he's able to give her now anything that she wants he also reveals his identity and as daisy runs away he chases after her and as we saw he's not only able to put people in his own hyper time but he's actually still even able to control his own speed in that time so now he's just like chasing after her really kind of like creepily mocking her as he stops in front of her and every time she tries to turn away he stops in front of her again they get far enough away that Virgil and the rest of the concert come back to the regular time and Virgil immediately notices that Daisy's gone. So he heads on out in his static gear to find her. Uh, fortunately for him, gear was able to work alongside with the uh, Eddie's former um, professor and they were able to put together a belt that would allow static to enter into hyper time without the help of Eddie so that the two of them can actually fight. The only thing is it will only work once and just like Ghostbusters rules, gear warns him that speed warp should not touch the belt because something could happen. I just realized this entire episode is a plot of clock stoppers. Oh no shit! <laughs> <laughs> it's the same it's the same thing. It's the Clock Stoppers, a classic movie, underrated in my opinion still. <laughs> Teenager gets a watch that lets him move so fast, everything goes slow. It's great. I'm not going to spoil anything else for you. Just go watch this. Uh, <laughs> Clock Stoppers. Can't recommend it enough. Um, <laughs> I'm watching it tonight. I'm watching <laughs> yeah, it tonight. There you go. <laughs> it, it's never a bad time. Um, luckily, uh, static and by the end of the battle the villain you know the villain can't resist doing the thing that they're not supposed to do so he does and he ends up in slow-mo permanently maybe yeah it, <laughs> um it is worrisome because <laughs> he's slowly saying that he has to get away and the amount of time that it takes him to blink i'm pretty sure his eyes would never be hydrated again um, so shout out to Visine, who's not sponsoring this episode, but it would be really helpful in this situation. <laughs> and as the episode ends, uh, they decide to just call the cops on, on Speed Warp because as static jokes, by the time he makes it to the end of the block, it'll be Christmas. And Virgil heads on back to the concert first. Daisy does return, not knowing that Virgil has, not, has actually just returned himself. And she lets him know everything that went down. She lets him know that Static was able to save her, that Eddie is, has been taken into custody. And the date basically continues. She grabs Virgil's hand to get their date back on track. And much like the track we experienced in our next episode, it's time to talk about when rubber meets the road. Yes, and we know it's been a while uh, since we've seen Rubber Man Man really in action not counting when he broke out of that facility and had to fight two seconds after. <laughs> um, and it's one of the episodes where they remember Sharon and rubber band man are dating. And <laughs> Oh, right. <laughs> like this, there are long periods of time where it's not a factor. <laughs> and so 
while they're trying to have a nice meal and go out together, we realize that Rubber Band Man can't read the menu mm -hmm. um, because he has dyslexia. Something, you know, we were completely unaware of to this point. To the point where, you know, I, I'm not, I'll only address this at the top and then we'll, you know, treat it normally. I am not sure if anything in continuity before this disregards that. I'm almost positive it does, but because they're doing something nice here, I'll, uh, I'll allow it, but I'm pretty sure this would have come up much sooner, but. Yeah. I also tried to figure this out. I was like, there is no way that at any point rubber band man didn't read a newspaper, didn't see a sign. And this never came up. Like, there's just it's just too complicated like he we would have at least seen it in his first premiere episode uh and then also when he had to fight coolio like the the two he had to read the contract that mm -hmm. aj mclean would have given him so it is a little if, if there's no if, there, if there's at no point that he ever read anything then um really that's just amazing work for the story writers and the animators and the people who put this together because they were able to keep this on the low, just as Rubber Band Man has done for this entire time. But um, as Adam and Sharon are trying to figure, are looking at the menu, um, Adam decides that he does show that he has ways to get around not having to, um, to just deal with his dyslexia in the moment by saying things like, Sharon, like, I'll order whatever you're getting because you have such good taste. And even when things start to go down, as we cut to a scene where Alva Industries is being attacked by this molten monster, and this thing is basically getting attacked by everything that Edwin Alva has at his disposal, the electronic um, security guards and all that, it gets quickly reported on the news. And even in this moment, Adam looks over to Sharon and asks her, can you read to me what the news bulletin is saying at the moment? Because according to him, there's too much of a glare on the TV screen. So Rubber Band Man bounces into action. And now we have Tarmac, you know, classic villain Tarmac is here <laughs> uh, to oppose Rubber Band Man and Gear and Static. And at one point, uh, they, while they're fighting, Rubber Band Man needs to read a, override button but he has trouble doing so so this cost them you know a chance to get ahead in the fight so gear is very again this is one of the episodes where <laughs> richie is uncharacteristically mean mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and he's just kind of ripping into rubber band man a little bit and yeah things are just going sideways for the crew now they all go to debrief in Edwin Alva's um, office. This is where we see that Rubber Band Man and Richie and, and Static are finding out that what was stolen was a device that basically has the power of a nuclear reactor, which, again, what is up with the patents? in the DC animated universe that this kind of stuff could just be made and no one is making like crazy amounts of money on it. Yeah, this, they need to, this, they need Superman to fly around this world too and get rid of all the nukes because <laughs> they clearly cannot handle what's going on. And if that's not bad enough, not only do they have to deal with this nuclear weapon, but one of the most dangerous villains has returned. Carmen Dillo, guys. Carmen Dillo is back. Uh, more dangerous than ever. <laughs> yes, because my boy is asking for the main thing that he needs whenever he's going through his day. Nachos. Or rather mm. money for nachos. <laughs> so as Tarmac, he has dropped off the, the device. We see that he is dropped off the device to his new contracted people, uh, Specs and Trapper. They have paid him a good sum of money to steal this device. 
all while kind of mocking him for his low level intelligence, which is unchar- which is basically very much characteristic for these two. And Tarmac leaves very abruptly. He takes his cash. He goes over to the the pool hall that we commonly see where all these villains hang out with. And Carmen Dillo is there, you know, making his presence known that he's the the top OG here in our in our pool hall as he's asking for Tarmac to give him some money so he could buy some nachos. And Tarmac is thrilled to give him some money. Um, he's saying that, you know, I pulled this job. I was able to steal this device from Alva Industries. And because of that, I got paid like thousands of bucks. And this is when Carmen Dill starts to laugh in his face because he's just like, bro, the machine that you stole and only got like two, three grand for, Edwin Alva is calling for a safe return and is willing to pay a million dollars. You basically are... I might as well call you to give pay you like a dollar to go steal from Fort Knox. Like, bro, do something different. Yeah. Um, everyone's real dumb in this one. <laughs> um, but outside of the villains, uh, the real struggle that they want to focus on is what um, Rubber Band Man is going through. So Static kind of gets up in his face about it and asks, uh, basically asks Adam slash Rubber Band Man to read CD reviews. You know, obviously this is where he has to be up front and says, you know, he's dyslexic. He, you know, wasn't ready and to handle like the, the burden of learning all these techniques to get back on track. So that's kind of held him back. And, you know, obviously he's done well for himself. He had a whole music career and everything. Yeah. But he just never got the opportunity to overcome that struggle. And now, you know, in his crime fighting, it's becoming more apparent that some things need to change for him. Yeah. And Static is sharing that he's willing to help, by which I mean, he's really given some profound advice, much like his father probably would have in this kind of scenario, which I did. Like, I think that this is very typical of Static to just share that, like, you know, I'm willing to help you. But the most important thing is that, like, I can't help you without you helping yourself. And their conversation gets quickly interrupted, though, as Gear flies over. He announces that he's actually able to find out where the energy is being spit out of from this device that they need to look for. So the three of them hop into action as they head on over to possibly where Spex and Trapper may be, although they don't know yet it's Spex and Trapper. And we cut to a scene where, as Spex and Trapper's lair where Tarmac arrives and he's demanding for more money. He needs, he's saying that he realizes now that he was shortchanged on what he got. And this is when they are kind of being open with just saying that like, all right, we will share with you what, what we have. So here's everything that we plan to do revealing that much like in the hoop squad episode they plan to use their machine called the disaster matrix to to send through seismic waves into the foundation of dakota that will then reduce the city to rubble and by doing so they'd be able to hold the city for ransom um and tarmac is looking pleased he's like all right i cut a good deal here Unfortunately, though, Specs and Trapper show that once again, they are no strangers to double cross as they start taking down Tarmac. So once again, because Rubber Band Man was unable to read a warning sign, causes more trouble for the mission and derails it. But um, again, Virgil's there to support him. And now it's time for, I mean, the showdown of the century, guys. It's going to be Tarmac. It's going to be rubber man, man. <laughs> and it's going to be static for, for the, the grudge match of the century. As much as we'd love to win by brute force alone, the problem is this nuclear reactor machine is just going to go haywire unless rubber band man can type in the right things into the machine. So now he has to use those techniques he learned to manage his dyslexia to 
input the right codes and hopefully save the world. The main question I had in this scenario is that Edwin Alpha created this machine um, and it had a multi-step process for, for stop it from melting down and destroying the city. So Edwin Alva, why did you incorporate so many steps into a fail safe is my biggest question of all, because Rubber Band Man has to now, in, in a really cool scene, he takes whatever pops up on the screen for him in this little device that opens up the instructions uh, basically it looks kind of like a blackberry uh he opens up the, the the instructions on the device and and he now has to raise the letters onto his arm and we see him kind of feeling out each of the letters to try to figure out what the word word is saying it's almost as if he's um kind of like using in a way almost like braille in order to um to understand what he has to do and it's a very intense, high-pressure scene already because he only had two minutes. Tarmac, we, he, we were able to handle that scenario. But because he only has the two minutes and he knows that he has to go through multiple steps, he's, like, sounding out everything. And then with only three seconds left on the clock, he now has to figure out if the word he's trying to spell is clockwise or counterclockwise. While static and gear are flying flying into the situation um again gear doesn't know anything about rubber band man's dyslexia static is just worried because gear saying things like you know it's okay because all rubber band man has to do is just read the instructions and we see that static is just like oh crap okay let me let me put a little pep in my step as they make it in just in time to to help him out but fortunately for them a rubber band man was able to figure out the right way to turn it after the decipher- deciphering his letters to shut down the machine with one second left on the clock. And we end our our scenario there where everybody's feeling good and gear is just super confused as to why it was such a big deal for Rubber Band Man to read. Again, there's a default to just make gear an asshole when they need him to be. <laughs> um, that, though that just is not him. Um, and before you can wonder why the hell specs and trapper are out of jail after last time um (laughs) we cut to the end of the episode which you know lets down the fourth wall to talk about dyslexia directly to the audience giving some statistics about how many people come to terms with it and how you can you know approach it and you know trying to remove some of that stigma around dyslexia again there's one thing i do like about the static series is that when they do these after school special kind of episodes and they have their break the fourth wall piece, it never really feels as if it's like that, you know, Spider-Man homecoming Captain America scene. He's flipped around the chair. He's, you know, talking to you kind of bro to bro. It, it's always like, it feels like it makes sense with the, with the episode as it does with this one. Cause we see rubber band man even showing and explaining how the letter B could look like the letter D for him or how one could be now or even something completely different. So, and as we, as they kind of wrap this up and talk about, you know, you know, talk to a parent, talk to a teacher, if you're ever experiencing things like this and if you need help, um, our episode ends. So now we have to figure out what was the best episode and which one do you think, um, you know, didn't make the, the the cut for the Hoop Squad team, according to the NBA. <laughs> I mean, none of these, all of these deserve to be alternates, uh, third alternates <laughs> in the Hoop Squad team. But, you know, we, we always have to pick one. Man, this is a rough week. <laughs> this is another one of those rough batches. Um, so I'm going to say the worst episode in this batch for me, unfortunately, is going to be rubber meets the road for me. Um, I like the message. I really do like the message. And normally I am all about static, taking time to address real life issues. But, you know, in previous episodes, when it wanted to address issues around homelessness, the entire plot was built around that in a very organic way with a character we had not been introduced previously to before. And by doing that and actually 
integrating that into the episode, they made one of the best episodes of the series to date. Mm -hmm. Problem when you throw in something like dyslexia into a show like this that has been running for a while is that we have to do a lot of backwards math to figure out if rubber band man was actually, you know, suffering from this condition the entire time, or if this was just something added, it feels added. Mm -hmm. And it feels like he was put into these very artificial situations around his, his um, dyslexia that have literally never come up before in other fights. So it just felt so forced that they were just using a character and twisting them, bending him literally <laughs> to fit what they needed to do. So um, I, I just felt that was very artificial and very forced. And I would have preferred them create a new original character. Mm -hmm. And there are so many one-off metas that they have brought onto the show. I, this would have been a great time to introduce one who you know, is saving the day, but they notice, you know, they, they're missing things that should be obvious, like signs and stuff. And that's when you can address it in a more organic way. Um, I just don't understand the logic of making Rubber Band Man the spokesman for this um, when he had not been previously. Uh, so that, that fell short for me. And then in terms of the other two, can I, with good conscience, say Hoop Squad was the best of these three? <laughs> no, I can't. And I'm not going to. <laughs> oh, thank God. I thought another celebrity guest star would have made this the number one. <laughs> no, no. This is no Romeo. This is close to the shack. Um, now you see him. Because, no, it's not a particularly strong episode. The villain is way too overpowered, mm -hmm. again. But what I will give it is it does try to make a point about the dangers of obsession and stalking and it tries to do some something with that on a level that's safe for kids to process and understand so i can appreciate what it's doing there um you know that poor mall is devastated and we didn't get too many b2k songs but narratively it doesn't have that many holes that i have to worry about and there's no guy called Pointer shooting out sharp objects <laughs> for the NBA in between all-star games. So I will let this week, I'll, I'll let now you see him barely take the top spot. <laughs> Where are you in this? Uh, so I agree on the best episode. I think, um, again, this is a... Not, not the strongest it's just a base of circumstance but uh now you see him agreed on the the same things of being able to showcase uh issues of toxic masculinity and the 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 signs of obsession and things that you need to be careful of when we see characters and people like this acting in this way um it wasn't, again, it wasn't the strongest finish because we did have to deal with, uh, basically, it was definitely someone who was a bit overpowered. And to be honest, uh, this dude is basically speed trap, the form of, of Mr. Trapper from our Trouble Squared episode back in season three. This is basically speed trap with a new color design and whatnot. Um, they did change up the powers just enough, but, you know, like, some of the things I wish they did was I wish they kind of made like a flash joke, given the fact that both gear and static have interacted with the flash now at this point. Oh my God. You just reminded me of, Oh my God. This almost, this almost knocked it out of consideration for top. It was almost going to be hoop spot. <laughs> because, oh <my> God. <laughs> because I, at first I was upset about the fact that they don't recognize this since they both met the flash. They know mm -hmm. the super speed from the jump. <laughs> yes. They never comes up. I got over it. <laughs> <laughs> Did you though? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> but yeah, I think that the message in there uh, was just enough for for kids to to understand like the there are some uh, the dangers that are being showcased there. But again, the the worst episodes. Ugh, this is a race to the finish. Um, 
didn't like the fact that we had another rubber band man episode because I feel like, again, this particular story was shoehorned into the series. I feel like it's been like that since the episode, I think the previous episode as well, just like including rubber band man into these kind of stories. It doesn't need as much work as they think it should have. Um, I think, again, I agree. I actually would have appreciated this more if it was a new brand new character um, because to backtrack and think is like, has a rubber band man ever read a newspaper? Have we seen him do it? Um, you know, like they made it seem like it was such a strong presence in his life, even though we've seen him still work around it. And the fact that in this particular scenario, now it's time that it's like it, it comes on the full force. It that seems weird to me. Um, but I have to give it to Hoop Squad be, mainly because <laughs> the fact that your villain was defeated on site in one minute and 35 <laughs> seconds is despicable. After he had was one of the craziest ways to take over the world. You know, I'm also going to have to give it to Hoop Squad just based off of... uh, Apparently, this is an episode that Dwayne McDuffie did not even want to produce, but he was forced to by the WB execs. This is... I don't know if this is true or not, but it is a... Given the fact of the way that it came across, it does feel like that. It it Uh, does feel like he had a gun to his head while he was writing. (laughs) (laughs) So... I'm, I'm siding with our boy uh, because this is not something I would have wanted. Like, I, I guess they were probably trying to capture the magic that they had with, with Shaq. Um, but it just wasn't there. A lot of it just seems really random. It does not feel like a season four. This should have been even added into season four. Like this, this just seems like maybe a, a one-off comic, maybe if they, if they really wanted to put it together, but uh, the whole episode and the fact that now learning that my entire childhood was a lie because I really thought that Yao Ming, Tracy McGrady, and Steve Nash actually voiced these characters. I mean, no disrespect to the actual voice actors, but to find out now that it wasn't them is a bit of a slap to the face because um, it sounds like to me they just blew their whole money on Carl Malone to say a few lines <laughs> and all of which was just basically, hey, Static, don't beat yourself up. Or, oh my gosh, it's static. It's just, it's, no. So, Hoop Squad, you get my, you get the worst episode for me for this week. Yeah, and I, and I just want to quickly mention, that is why I, I, if you go back and you see how harsh I was on Shaq about his voice acting, they probably somehow jumped into the future, saw, listened to that episode of our podcast, then jumped back and said, hey, let's not use all real basketball players for the next time we do this. And uh, so that's what happened. Speed force timelines. It's very complicated, but, uh, but yeah, that's what happened. Oh, and I also want to suggest that maybe when static went back in the past, there was a flashpoint event and that's why rubber band man has his sexy out of nowhere. Maybe. Oh my, it was, it was static all along. It was static point. (laughs) (laughs) Dang, try to save your mom and gave my boy dyslexia. Like, bro, that's uncool. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that was our two episodes. And we do have some comic book knowledge for y'all today, as we do have an actual comic book villain appear in one of these episodes outside of the ones that we've already established. Any guesses on who they may be? I'm guessing out of all of this. The the villain that is definitely in the comics is Dr. Evil Labcoat. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I do see a lot of parallels to um what's his name? Dr. Wiley from, from Mega Man. Oh yeah. I feel like he and the other doctor that was leading the NBA, the two of them are basically the two, two same doctors from the Mega Man series. Uh you know, I big. I always love Mega Man. It's, this is a cool character. But anyway, <laughs> the character who is actually from the comics is Tarmac. Tarmac. Uh, yes. of all of them, it's Tarmac. Yes, and my dude is pulled right from the comic. Like legit, everything about him is the exact same. <laughs> Design everything. They were just yep. like, you know what works for us. <laughs> 
So yes, uh, Tarmac is a true static villain. He actually is the second villain that Static has to face off against in his original run. Uh, he premiered in Static Number 2 back in 1993. He has since appeared in several Milestone comics. I Hopefully we do get a chance to see him again in um, some upcoming series, but he is a proud member of the Blood Syndicate gang uh, because much like in this episode, he also received his powers during the Big Bang. Unfortunately for him, his name is Charles Bell. He, during the Big Bang, during the gang fight, uh, he got taken out by the gas, of the Big Bang gas, the quantum juice, as it's called in the comics. And he, because he ends up lying down on the road being, after being knocked out, the road morphs along with him, giving him the abilities of the tarmac, hence the name tarmac. You know what? All right. All right. I'll let him have that one. <laughs> so everything about him is the same as i mentioned he is able to manipulate his body honestly i will once i will give the main reason why i gave this episode a bit more um a bit more of a thumbs up than i would have is because tarmac in a way is a good parallel to a Batman, given their abilities ah uh, yes 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 bouncing off of an immovable object mm-hmm and which is why I wish that we had some more time for Tarmac and Rubber Band Man to fight against each other because of the fact that they're able to morph their bodies in different ways. But the key thing that Tarmac has above Rubber Band Man is the ability to create heat out of his body. He's um, thermokinetic, as it's called. He's able to do so. And as we saw in the episode, he was able to, um, as Rubber Band Man tried to wrap around him, he was able to raise his body temperature enough to burn off Rubber Band Man. Unfortunately, though, for him, he is just as, well, I, I guess I'm going to say he isn't street smart. Um, <laughs> um, he does get picked on a lot in the comics because of the fact that, you know, he wants to become a big time villain, as we kind of saw in this episode, felt the energy of and he, in his conversation with Carmen Dillo. However, he does do things that does give, does make people give him a second look. So in the comics, he ultimately becomes an enforcer um, for the villain Holocaust, who is Static's main nemesis in the comics. And a quick recap on Holocaust, he is also a member of the Blood Syndicate gang. He eventually wants to try and take it over. He then ends up take, creating his own gang, and he brings Tarmac along with him. And a reminder of Holocaust's power set, he is the character that we were saying that is basically like Ebon and Hot Street put together. However, in the comic... Holocaust really wanted to hire Hot Streak, but he couldn't because he saw that Stag beat him pretty easily. So he sent out Tarmac to test out Stag's powers once again before he asked him to join his team, which Static easily defeats Tarmac. He actually, to, as an insult to injury, uses a steamroller to combine him with the street to take him out completely. Damn, you can't come back from that. <laughs> Uh, I mean, normally you wouldn't, but because Tarmac has regenerative um, abilities, he does come back. However, he does take his final L um, after he gets into a fight with the rest of the heroes of the Dakota universe as Hardware, um, who we kind of talked about back in a couple of episodes. He sh shoots off a cryonic shell that freezes Tarmac. And with no warning that basically there's icy roads ahead in his future. And that is the last time that we saw Tarmac. Wow. Wow. His, uh, his comic history is just as impressive as his episode history. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he uh, really reached the end of the road on, on that one there. <laughs> ah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, that is it for comic book knowledge. Fortunately for us, Carl Malone... Um, <laughs> not Tracy McGrady, not Yao Ming, and not Steve Nash did not make appearances in the comics. And uh, in the Now You See Me episode, honestly, this just feels as if they just tried to recreate the abilities that Speed Trap had in a more in a, in a way that makes more sense, as well as deliver the message that toxic masculinity is not a favorable trait. So get rid of that shit. Yeah. That might be it for our celebrity cameos for the rest of the series. Damn it, I was really hoping that we'd get some more early 2000s 
stars <laughs> in there. So I got to ask, who, who's been your favorite one so far? <laughs> I, you know who it is. You already know. It's Little Romeo. My, my number one episode. <laughs> A few weeks back, I I'm not gonna take it back. <laughs> <laughs> I was really hoping that Carl Malone would have pulled it out for us, or at least the sound snippet of B2K dancing around. <laughs> Sorry, Little Romeo had a character arc that stretched limo <laughs> that extended past the whole block. It could not make any turns whatsoever. <laughs> let's be honest with ourselves. <laughs> not at all. All right, well. That's it for our episode, and that's it for our celebrity cameos. So until our next episode, take care of yourselves, and remember that if your parents are mad at you for breaking curfew, have an NBA player call them to be your alibi. Yeah, and if somebody interrupts your B2K concert to take you in a hyper time, pack a clock stopper's watch and get out of there. <laughs> watch clock stoppers. <laughs> <laughs> 